On my 19th birthday, we evacuated Beirut because of the war. Our house was hit. I landed in Boston and I said, what the heck, I'll apply to MIT School of Architecture. <laughs> but I had nothing with me, just the yearbook I had designed for my school. I actually showed it to the admissions committee and I got in. And on that day, I learned something so important. I learned that design matters. However, it ch design matters. Design changed my life. It opened doors for me, like it did on that day. But working in design for the past 25 years, I find that design is still considered an afterthought. Something that comes at the end of the process, design as decoration. Designers, do you hear me? Thank you. I'm bothered by that, and I'm sure Many designers feel that way. We work so hard, we struggle so hard, and yet our work isn't always taken seriously. We stay on the margin. Maybe that's why we wear black. <laughs> but I'm on a mission to change that. I'm on a mission to make design matter. And for design to matter, design thinking has to matter. If creativity is the driving force of a new economy, I happen to believe that then businesses must engage us designers early on in the process. And all of you are holding devices and have ideas that benefit from integrated design thinking. So one of my first challenges working in a design think tank in Boston, that we were tasked to predict the future. And to predict the future, we needed to understand change. And the most significant change in our lifetime has been the internet. So for, order, for us to understand and predict the future, we need to understand how networks have evolved. So the first type of network is a simple one-to-many network, a central node distributing to the members in the network. A one-to-many network like television or the lecture. And the value of this lecture or of this network is V equals to the N, I don't want to lose you with the numbers, they're quite simple, that the value of the network increases with the number of users in direct proportion, so that if there are 10 users, they can generate up to 10 possible connections. But now imagine you remove the center of the network. What happens? You get a one-to-one -one network, a peer-to-peer -peer network, like the telephone or email, and the simple act of removing the center actually squares the value. So the 10 users that you had now are able to generate up to 100 possible connections. So the shift is radical. Who of you here uses social media? All right, I see that most of you do, and I ask you a question. What's the difference between email and, say, Facebook? What's the difference? Basically, it's our ability to form groups. Forming groups explodes the value of the network exponentially so that the value is now 2 to the power n, which we call Reed's law. And can you imagine that the 10 users now can generate over 1,000 possible connections? So the future is in group forming, and that's what we have to design for. Okay, let's wrap our head around these ideas with some random examples, and I mean random examples from life. So, when we go to the coffee shops today, we spend a lot of time there, but what we actually go for is the experience and not so much the service. We go there to work, to study, to collaborate, to engage. We do different things over a period of time, and we pay over 5,000 liras for a cup of coffee, when you can get a good cup of coffee for a fraction of that amount from any street vendor. Because our ability and our freedom to form groups increases the value of coffee. The way we get knowledge also is evolving. We don't need to know everything. All we have to do is to know who to call, who to contact, whom to ask, 
to get the information that we need. We tap into our network, we form a spontaneous, spontaneous group to get the knowledge that we need, like TV game shows. What's the, what's the lifeline but calling a friend, asking the audience, we heard from Amal about the wisdom of the crowd. We form a group to increase our knowledge base. Football. I told you the random. Football. If you were to design a football game or a football team that takes group forming to the next level, what might you think of? If you thought Spain, you're thinking along the right lines. Because Spain decentered their attacking force and they have a controversial network of midfielders and they dominate the game today. But I want you to think with me even further. What could be the future of a, of a field game when we bring in group forming? I'll give you a hint. Harry Potter, anyone? Quidditch, that's right. Quidditch, Harry Potter sport has two teams with three groups each. It's a three-dimensional field. It really helps if you can fly. Three types of balls, three goals, and multiple ways to win, and endless possibilities for collaboration. We heard from Dr. Charles about collaboration. It's the way of the future workplace. Even in the office, multidisciplinary teams come together. They generate much more innovation than individuals alone. And so in 1999, I was tasked to design the future workplace. This was in Los Angeles. And in those days, Google barely existed. We didn't have a role model to follow. We couldn't do the cool things they were doing because we, we didn't see them yet. And the CEO was very clear in the design brief. He said, anyone, anywhere, at any time could be part of any conversation. So what type of conversations take place in a creative workplace, in a learning environment? The first type is brainstorming. Sharing ideas, exchanging ideas, and not judging ideas. Then we have to reflect on them and make sense of them, and then we have to debate them to come up with decisions. So in the Los Angeles space, what we did, we created spaces with multiple settings, like the workshop here, where we have a large area for brainstorming. Up in the treehouse, we have a place for reflection and smaller rooms for groups to gather and have focused discussions. In the lobby, we followed the same strategy, multiple settings, informal spaces for brainstorming, day beds, comfortable settings for individual reflection, and a more formal room for decision making. If you notice under the green sign, there's a sliding door, and that's there for a purpose. Because if we want everyone to be engaged in the conversation, the sliding door allows you to put your head in without disrupting the space like a regular door would do. So we went into the details of that as well. Thank you. We also blurred the boundaries between the spaces. Different social spaces penetrate into each other. And to encourage knowledge accidents, we allowed people to walk around the space and decide and chart their own path depending on how social they feel. Because identity in the big space and within the group is important. And for us to develop the identity of these spaces, especially the reflection spaces, we asked our community, said, what do you want to have with you when you're in the zone? And they gave us a list of things that they like to have. And from this list, we came up with new possibilities for these smaller rooms. Sandflowers, daybed, and, and the sand floors. Another one with lava lamp, leather walls, and a funky chair. And we developed all these systems. And what we were able to do was create new possibilities because we tapped into the crowd. We listened. Our next task was here in Lebanon in 2005 when AUB asked us to predict and design the future learning environment. And we learned three things in our research. Engaged learners learn through discovery. Remember March this morning where the teacher becomes a co-learner and the, and the students find their own way? That's the way of the future. It's a group forming. And the biggest competition is Starbucks. 
because that's where the students spend their time. That's where they learn, that's where they exchange, and that's where they're getting the most knowledge today. And the third insight is that our students love to talk. The teachers in the audience, I'm sure you know what I mean. They talk on the side, before, after, and during class. So our, exper our experimental designs for AUB, we did different things. And at the AUB lecture hall, engineering lecture hall, we placed lounges within the lecture hall to spatialize conversations. Here's a group at the entrance, and here's another one closer to the podium. These spaces challenge the authority of the lecture format. They encourage group-based learning. And these ideas are catching on. A recent Harvard study found that students who studied in groups learned significantly more than those who worked on their own. We did the same thing in the library. Multiple settings, colorful lounges, multiple identities, and we even created soundproof rooms. So these groups go in there and be as loud as possible without disrupting the library space. <laughs> and the library space is completely transformed because these spaces encourage multiple possibilities and people to work in groups. And today, AUB has a hard time asking these students to leave the library. because V equals 2 to the power N is now spatialized. So when you look at the spaces we inhabit, I urge you, when you leave here, to start looking around you and ask yourself, are the spaces that I use meet my new values? Are they empowering me to become a creator? Because in the future, knowledge will emerge in groups and conversations. Individuals will express their identity within these groups, and design will matter more. Thank you. Thank you.